Yeah, so I'll be uh, presenting a tool that we have developed within our research group for um, very specific uh, data management needs that we have. And just as a, uh, a big picture, maybe uh, what we do is we, we do uh, electrodynamic simulations, particle simulations, and a lot of uh, raw data in terms of the forms of uh, trajectory data, particle um, trajectory data. And um, this uh, tool was particularly designed to meet the data management and workflow needs that we have in this group. So uh, just to uh, clear up some, some housekeeping here, what I'm actually talking about is a framework that means a, a collection of different tools that are supposed to work together. Um, they're all released open source and freely available, so if you want to use them, you can. Um, they are uh, implemented in Python uh, 2 and 3, and we have a website uh, where you can find more information than you are. Let's uh, answer the first question first. Why did we call it Signac? It's named after uh, Paul Signac, who together with Joe Savai invented the pointless painting technique. That's a technique where you create a natural image like this one here uh, using tiny little painting dots. And uh, now we are kind of familiar with this uh, concept of computer image pixels. But at the time, that was a very novel way of creating images. And we use this as a metaphor for our data model of the state of the world. Each of these painting dots is like and, uh, data point, and as long as we can put them together in the right way, we can get the big picture. Um, it also serves as a kind of a really concise, nice thing. So, uh, let me start by laying out the primary goals that we have when we uh, started on this. Um, we think that a, a good data management solution for us uh, should enable us to uh, search our data and also share. So, as long as we can ourselves can actually search our data. That's like the first step to actually making it shareable. If we can't even you know, define our own schema or search our, our data, uh, nobody else will be able to do that either. The second thing is it actually needs to make, uh, it actually needs to reduce barriers. It should reduce the effort to do what we want to do. If we actually increase barriers, we create an energy barrier that will prevent the adoption in the first place, so we won't be able to meet the first goal either. So when we started, we uh, kind of came up with this like very abstract workflow model, which is supposed to be general enough that it essentially captures any kind of computational workflow that has some kind of data pipeline. Um, at the same time, uh, it's supposed to be concrete enough that we can actually uh, develop based on it. And so we think at the, at the start of any kind of computational investigation, there's a definition of a parameter space. Um, so what kind of models do we want to study? Which kinds of uh, parameters are we interested in? And once we have defined that, we uh, enter a data acquisition process. That means the generation of data, the collection of observables from experiments, or even the, uh, the uh, import of existing data from public or private repositories. After that, we need to go through a data curation step where we need to make sure that all kinds of form formats are homogeneous. Uh, we may need to treat errors and missing values. And in general, we could convert the raw data into a form that is accessible to our and with that, we can then do analysis on the data and extract results and conclusions of the information. One of the things that all of these three processes in the center have in common is that they act on one shared data space, where data space for us means the raw data itself, so the numbers, possibly text, um, and metadata, which is the format definition and possibly uh, some provenance, where did the data actually come from, how was it produced? Anything that we need to know to make sense of the data itself. And if we go through this kind of process once, we usually are fine if we don't have too complex workflows to actually cook up our own solution. However, um, we may enter very necessary feedback loops. So after our analysis, we may discover that we need to adjust our parameters to push limit for the different, different spaces. And that's where we create a lot of complexity. Um, this is where one of the challenges come from. And we think that a, a good workflow like this uh, should be reproducible uh, for science sake, obviously, but also for own sake. Um, it should be flexible to actually be able to accommodate for these kind of feedback loops. And it should be scalable, and I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. And so our, our solution comes in right between these processes that operate on data 
and the data space itself. So as long as we basically funnel all our data streams through such an interface, we can start making certain assumptions about the schema and how the, how the data is organized. And that's where the management part basically comes in. So I mentioned scalability. We think there are two important dimensions here for us. One of them is the product timeline. So thinking about setting up a new computational investigation with an idea. I just want to explore some, uh, some things that I, I just thought of, essentially, and may want to run some test scripts to, to generate some preliminary data. And uh, we think that a good solution should be able to actually be able to do that. It's kind of bootstrapping. You should, shouldn't be able to do this from the first minute, essentially, without too much hassle. At the same time, it should, should be able to support the upscale to, for productive uh, uh, generation of uh, results and um, possibly an archival. The second dimension is the uh, environment complexity. So we're thinking of maybe running these first few, few tests on a, on a, app, on a uh, platform, and then we may uh, scale up to a cloud or workspace, a workstation, or even to a leadership supervisor. So we think a good solution should be able to work in all of these uh, dimensions. Uh, otherwise, we create breaks, we create um, interruptions, and, and may, may actually increase the, the workload and the effort that we need to put into this. Same time, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean that we need to use this in all of these dimensions. We may find that there are better tools at some point. But we just want to say, ideally, it's at least possible to run in all of these dimensions. So when we, we look for solutions, um, we, and, and started developing things. Uh, we actually uh, had a bunch of uh, challenges that we commonly encountered. Um, we could also call it lessons learned on our own, on our own for, uh, from our own perspective. And that is, um, we found a, a data management system is hard to apply whenever it convolutes data and workflow management. This is actually, I think, one of the most important aspects here. A lot of solutions require you to not only move your Data management into, into the solution, but also your workflow management. And that is problematic. Whenever your workflow is actually not really transferable to this, you have different kinds of needs, it actually increases the effort you need to, uh, to, to move into that solution. Or you may have, for example, you may have very simple requirements, and any kind of solution that makes certain assumptions about your workflow is over engineered for that. The second one is, uh, requirement of running extra services. So I'm thinking here of uh, databases, extra schedulers. Um, that may be problematic. Again, if it's just, you know, not, if it's over-engineered for a kind of problem you have, it may create uh, security issues. It may be problematic to run such things on on, uh, on a supercomputer. So that's when we kind of start creating this kind of breaks. It may not scale well, and this is not only the uh, scaling between laptop and computer, especially from you know the first few things, the first few trials to productive. And the fourth one is it may be too complex um, and not really transparent. And what I mean by that is that a solution that kind of serves as a black box that basically takes everything away from you and says, "Well, you don't have to care about how things work anymore at all." That may be nice for very specific use cases, but in reality, it also means that we can't really adjust it anymore. So if we have some kind of um, requirement to adjust what's happening and adapt it to whatever group we're interested in, then if that black box is really a problem. So with that in mind, we uh, developed a design philosophy that we tried to follow as best as possible up to this point, we're still following it. And so in relating it to the challenge, we really try to separate data and workflow management. At this point, practically, that means that we have our data management in the, in the core package and any kind of workflow related stuff in you know, a different package. So we force ourselves in that way to not have any kind of interdependency there. Um, we want to make it easy to deploy it. So we don't have any requirements besides Python, and that works on basically any environment now. I mean, Python was super, might have been a problem a couple of years ago, but nowadays that's not an issue anymore. And we Keep it local and decentralized. We don't want you to run services or don't require you to run services. And we want to, to spread out and, and use the local file system essentially as the, as the main local file line. And we use a, a very simple and transparent data model. At least that's what I, what, what I think 
so, uh, so I'm making that plane, so let me just explain that real quick. Uh, I mentioned the pointless painting technique in the beginning, so let's imagine we have this gray block here, which is a slice of a high dimensional parameter space, called ABC here. Think of model parameters, temperature, pressure, those are the kind of examples that we're referring to here. And each of these points here represents a data point, which may be a single number or word, or it might be terabytes of data. That's really up to the interpretation of, of how you use this. And as long as we have like a regular grid like that, we might be fine, but like you can create complexity really easily, having different uh, grid densities, you may want to select certain subspaces instead of that's one of you know, essentially filters coming into a place. And essentially, as long as we can relate any of these data points to the to a concrete set of metadata, we are in a very good spot. That actually creates what we think is a well-defined data space. We have a well-defined schema where we have key value pairs here, essentially, that represent our metadata, whatever that means for your use case. And we have the data itself, also key value pairs and file. So um, I just mentioned our metadata is document-oriented. We're using JSON to uh, encode it. And it's, it's split into two parts. One is what we call a state point, which is more or less a static data address. Um, the concept here is if you change the state point, you essentially invalidate your data. On the other hand, we have uh, what we call a document that's more dynamic metadata, such as runtime information, anything else that you know may fit well into some kind of key value storage. And then the data itself is mostly file oriented. That is to support existing workflows really well. Um, we don't require you know to to funnel your data from some kind of file format into a table or other schema. If you already have well working file formats and files, just keep using them. So to make it really concrete, uh, I took this example from uh, a paper by Wilson co-workers who laid out basically best practices to use in APT uh, computing and how you may want to organize your computational uh, projects. And they say, well, at least if you have some kind of project directory like this here, at least you should have one where your scripts are, your source code is uh, in such a directory, where your data is, your documentation, and uh, ideally it's a kind of readme file that, that you know, explains all. And so we fit right between this here the source code and all the scripts that operate on the data and the data itself. And again, we try to say, let's, let's uh, operate on the data through that interface to be able to make it function. And also, in this way, uh, the data management solution becomes part of the documentation. So it, that makes it easier for you to understand what's going on, but especially for anyone when else who's inheriting the project, maybe, or who is uh, trying to use data that have been produced and for this project. So uh, with this, uh, I'd like to do a little bit of demonstration. And I wasn't as great uh, to do the live demonstration, so I'll leave the screencast. Um, the idea is to not, again, not to give you a tutorial here. It's more about um, giving you some sense of what, what I'm actually talking about here in practice. So first, um, I'm assuming I've already installed everything, uh, which is not hard to do. It's a pure Python package, so no compilation necessary. Um, I'm creating a project directory here, just like I showed earlier. And I call this function here, signature in my project, and then I'm done. And what I want to demonstrate here is that uh, if you're familiar with Git, for example, uh, Git will, will have has a Git init uh, function, which essentially creates a, a Git directory contain, containing configuration and other metadata. Um, that's essentially what's happening here as well. So we're creating a configuration file which contains the project name, and the, the location of the configuration file says, well, this is my project directory, and it gives us some kind of anchor of where things are. Uh, next thing, I would like to do a very brief demonstration of how we can operate, uh, interface our data, and I'll use a toy model, the ideal gas law, which allows us to uh, relate pressure, volume, temperature, and system size. And we'll imagine that we want to calculate the volume for different state points here for different pressures. And obviously, that's you know very cheap to do, but uh, in reality, this is like an example for maybe a much more complex simulation or some kind of you know, in intensive uh, uh, data operation. So let's see. Um, 
So I start by creating a script here called ideal gas of pi. And then I use the Python interface to integrate my, with my data. I import the package and I get this project handle that I can get now because I initialize the project in the And this project handle will be the interface to the metadata and data. And then iterate over my variable of interest, the pressure P here. Uh, I get a so called job handle which relates metadata and data for a specific state point. That's the metadata I was saying, uh, uh, referring to earlier. We have a specific pressure, temperature, and system size here, only the pressure variable. And then we calculate the uh, volume with the uh, ideal gas law here and store it in this document. Again, the, the uh, key value storage associated with this specific state point. And then I can execute that script and I populate my data space for these nine uh, points and then I can use senior client to actually you know visualize that and what we see here is a bunch of IDs with the re representative for the state point and obviously those are not meant to be human readable but more scriptable we can start searching for specific state points here find p5 p5 means given all state points with the pressure is five obviously one in this case we can start using uh, uh, means to extract the actual data of a readable form. Right now, we're only talking about metadata, essentially, not actual file uh, uh, data. Now we can use operators on this. So that so if you're familiar with MongoDB, for example, and another like a document oriented storage, that's that's where uh, that's essentially what we're doing here on a non uh, centralized and uh, non local one. And we can start searching uh, our our document as well. And this is also designed to be somewhat uh, in, a, in a unique style so that we can you know, pipe individual things together, start creating a, a, a data pipeline on the on the uh, bash level or on the on the Python one. So uh, this is so this is what I'm demonstrating here. So I'm getting these two IDs back and then I can pipe them to the other commands to uh, to get those results. Um, I mentioned that uh, we're actually more concerned about managing files, less uh, metadata like values. So let me do that. We're using this, this syntax here to just uh, change into the correct directory. Then we uh, store our volume instead of this document just in a file that we call it. Imagine again, this could be a full trajectory or something like that, uh, which may be, uh, uh, contain much more data than just one number. And with that, uh, you can execute the script again. And the, the files are actually stored in a transparent way. So we can actually look at the, uh, the, the data storage, and potentially how it was organized on this here. And obviously, these ideas are kind of obfuscating the actual data. So we have a way to uh, create a link view that is creating human readable file paths to uh, the actual data. And uh, this is what we did here. And so you can actually inspect your files on the file system if you want to um, in a way that is even accessible. And you will notice that um, the directory paths here are only containing the pressure. And that is because um, you can actually determine that the temperature and system size is constant over the complete selected data space. So uh, that is ignored and omitted because it would just demonstrate uh, noise in that case. Just uh, as a summary, we can uh, we can start selecting our uh, data based on these very simple queries here. Uh, we can relate the data and the, the uh, data address essentially, and we can start exporting that into kind of state of range. We can we can uh, it's it's supposed to work well together with other tools in that. So to just to show you a flowchart of what the data storage mode layout actually looks like, if we think of this project class as an interface between um, the, the operations and my uh, project directory here, essentially, then this is what is managed, this is workspace within uh, this directory, and it's then populated with the actual data. And we have a data operation like this here, we go over this interface where we actually operate on the on the human readable state point, which is then translated uh, into uh, the actual location. And also internally, 
This is all made possible by generating an index on the fly. So essentially, Senyak will go ahead and index this workspace um, efficiently to determine what is actually there, what is part of my data space, and what kind of state points can I uh, look into. And this index is, is necessary for internal searching and aggregation, but it's also accessible. So if you want to use that index explicitly, you can do so. And one example is you can take an index like that and store it in a MongoDB or any other kind of document or in the storage that understands JSON and uh, and have it explicitly in here. So you can you can use other tools and use their specific advantage advantages to um, to your uh, to code in. Um, you can also use this index uh, directly uh, using uh, Syndic itself. So this is a brief demonstration of that. So here I am uh, just you know pushing this index onto the onto the command line. Let's store that into I can pipe that into a file, and then I can operate on that file directly. So it's in, in some sense, um, Syndic serves as a, a MongoDB like, if you will, in this case here. And it's supposed to bootstrap this kind of workflow. If you don't, if you don't have tons of data yet, then you can just do that on the uh, on the file system and in memory. You won't have any problems. So I'm opening opening this collection here on on the on the uh, on the Python level and, and sort of searching and, and doing this, the same kind of queries that I did earlier um, on machine handling. And uh, one neat thing is that uh, if we if we search for specific state points here and select our data, for example, by, by format, uh, we get these documents back, which are part of the index. The document contains all the information, all the metadata that's relevant to our data. That means the uh, state point and the uh, location, potentially. We can use that, that path to open those files directly. But we can also um, use a uh, function called fetch, which will do that for you. And the advantage, advantage of that is both will not only work if it's on your local file system, but you can push the data actually into a database and, and it will work in the same way. You won't be able to figure out, well, I can't find it on my local file system, but maybe it's somewhere else. And so this is something we use, for example, to, to share data with collaborators. I'm using it locally. I have access to our local network file system, so it's really fast for me to open those files. But uh, my own collaborators can access our local file system on this. But they can't access the database that actually has the index. So we put the data there into the database as well. And now when they call the same script, the the uh, fetch function will actually figure out how I can actually pull it from the database. But so as a summary, the data space index um, means that we, we index this data space which is associated with our project. Uh, all data operations operate on the data through this interface. Where um, uh, the project internally manages this index, and we can access the index actually explicitly if we want to, and, and work with it. And that has another. This will be my last point with uh, concerning indexing. Has one more advantage. If we think of having multiple projects uh, A, B, C, and D here, which may or may not belong to the same owner, owner we can tag them as essentially uh, public or semi-public. And start compiling what we call a master index, which contains all the information about these individual indexes. And then we can start operating on the complete data space uh, without needing to actually worry where exactly those projects are. So I can, in, in practical terms, create an organization wide index of all data that have been stored in that kind of format. I can start searching for specific things without me really knowing, needing to know too much about uh, where data is actually stored or. or or so with this, I just uh, I like to summarize the main capabilities that we we implemented here. Uh, we um, implemented a file and metadata data management on the file system. We have the capability to search and select data by metadata. We can generate uh, uh, data space indices. We can export metadata and data into external databases. And we have a basic provision of, of workflows that work really well with this kind of uh, schema. <laughs> um, the package is documented on Read the Docs. Uh, we also have a set of Jupyter notebook, uh, Jupyter notebooks that serve as a tutorial, so you can download those or watch the seed book at the online. <laughs> if you would 
get an idea of how it works. And uh, in the future, we're uh, still working on, on consolidating some of the uh, workflow aspects I haven't really touched on yet. Um, we would like to be better about non Python driven workflows. The problem here is that most of us work with Python primarily to drive our workflows. So, anyone, so while we have the command line interface, it's, I would say, not as mature simply because we're not using that much. And uh, one other aspect that still remains is synchronization between uh, different stories. So I said, well, we store our data on, on the file system and that being anywhere. Um, but just to increase the uh, capability to synchronize between different ways a little better. So um, again, if you're interested, have a look at the website. Uh, I would like to thank my research group because they provided a lot of uh, support and feedback that helped us kind of converge on um, best practices implemented in this. Uh, but also uh, um, people outside of the group who provided feedback. Uh, the MyCom Center and NSF for funding and uh, you for your attention. I'm really happy to address your questions. So, so I showed nine, so yeah, okay. right? Yeah. Um, I've tested it up to a million, essentially, just to make sure we don't have any kind of hidden uh, scale problems there. And then it really depends on your file system. So, uh, this is why we're saying, like, we run it locally. The file system is usually the most performant way of storing data. So, uh, this is basically where it comes down. There's no, I guess, sort of thing. there's no inherent parallelism in terms of actually dual. I, I would argue there is because okay. um, yeah. if you if you look at um, a um, typical supercomputer workload that you know, spawn thousands and ten thousands of uh, nodes at the same time, if they all have some kind of centralized service that they need to call back to, then you actually create a huge people that will most likely bring their data to town. That's why we really try to avoid this kind of thing, unless you spawn databases and services per node. But it's, it's parallel in the sense that every single you know, yeah. instance knows exactly what to do. I guess so you have a bajillion Python. Yeah. <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> Are there any other questions? So let's thank Carl again.